Busy. When I texted you to come in about the show, Leeds were flying high in the championship yeah. and they were about to uh, basically say they were safe enough, they were going to go up to the Premier League and it's kind of fallen apart from them. Yeah, obviously the last couple of weeks they've had a few dodgy results, but I think uh, the other night against Millwall, getting a, uh, to come back from two down to win 3-2 and then on the same night, West Brom getting beat at Cardiff, just uh, momentum hopefully changed back a bit again. So yeah, I, I played a long time in that league, so you can't take anything for granted in that league. It's a really hard one to get out. Yeah, Championship especially just seems to be probably the most competitive league probably in Europe. Without doubt, yeah. yeah I've played lucky enough to play in the Premier League and the Championship. It's just a slog, really, really hard, tough games. Uh, a lot of the squads are very equal right throughout the, from, from top to bottom, so you can't call results, you can't call uh, anything because of the, the way the format is in terms of games every couple of days, so it, it is difficult to read. I know, especially in the life of football, things move fast. Can you believe it's 16 years since Leeds have been? No, ready? no, it's, it's incredible. Like uh, 2004, yeah, it's uh, unbelievable that a club that size. Um, Fell out of the league and uh, and still not back there yet. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, I think it's about time. Hopefully this year they can get across the line because I'm sure anyone that's been Dallin Road or uh, experienced uh, the city as a, a one club city, it's a it's a huge huge club that should be should be in the Premiership. But there's no guarantees in football, as you know. So just taking us back to 1996, you're a young player coming through the system and Leeds United saying you. This is probably probably post um, Cantona Leeds, if you want to put it that way. They're still a massive club. Yeah. What, how do you feel when you're signing for them? Yeah, it was obviously daunting. I was 15 at the time and um, leaving home, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but that's what I wanted to do from an early age. Um, and when I went to Leeds to visit and, and, and play there uh, as, at a 14, as a 14 year old, it was, uh, I just felt at home, felt uh, this was the right, the right place for me to, to enjoy the next few years as a player, so I just wanted to get stuck into the hard work that, that comes with it really. George Graham's the manager at the time, he hands you your debut against Leicester. Mm. What's your feelings going on to the pitch? Are you nervous? Are you looking to make an impact? And do you think that this is you now for the rest of your career? No, no, it, it was one, uh, I was warming up, Filbert Street, the old, the old Leicester Stadium, huge, massive stand on the dugout side, um, and he told me to go get warmed up, and I thought, the, the stomach started to, to sink, I was, I, was, uh, I think I was just turned 18, a matter of weeks or whatever, so, um, yeah, everything starts going through your head, we were, we just, just conceded a goal, I think we were, uh, 2-1 down at the time and uh, yeah, just everything starts going through your head. This is this is the chance you've always been waiting for, the thing I dreamt of. Um, and then to get the shout, to come back from the warm-up that you're going on, uh, yeah, everything starts going through your, through your mind, but you've got to concentrate what's going on on the pitch as well. So, amazing feeling, but just uh, still still can feel that now. Can you remember how you played? Yeah, I got, I was only, I think there was only about 10 minutes left, if I remember, in the game. Um, and straight away I got a touch of the ball, which was nice on the far, the far side in front of the, the other stand and, and played a nice pass and that sort of settled me a little bit and uh, had a little, we got a pen on within a couple of minutes of me coming on. Um, unfortunately, Jimmy Hasbank missed and ruined my debut, we were getting beat, but uh, no, it was, it, was, uh, it was really enjoyable. I, I just felt like after that first pass, I felt right. You know, I know I can do this and, and settled into the game. I know it was only 10 minutes, but I felt comfortable enough. Yeah, and I know your debut came against uh, Leicester away, but what was Ellen, Ellen Road like at that stage? Because even now when uh, Leeds are in the Championship, it's a fortress of a stadium, the atmosphere is always brilliant, but this is where Leeds were at their peak as a club. Uh, probably, they were probably at their peak in the 70s, but then this was a second mm. coming off the club. So... It must have been really special playing in that kind of stadium. It's an amazing place to play football. I think even the, the arc and the pitch, if, if anyone gets lucky enough to get down onto the pitch, is a little arc from, this, from the, the middle to the sides. And it's just, it's just the atmosphere it creates, the ball, the, the, 
even the, the run up to games, driving in, all that sort of things, I, I really, really remember. Um, special, special place to play football in. All the history that, that went with it, as you said, the 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 seventies and, and winning so many things that's always come up as you're, when you're a Leeds player. You see the see the pictures all around the ground and around the training ground of 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 the special time. So uh, yeah, I was lucky enough. We were flying high. Um, maybe not so much when I first got into the squad, but within a couple of years of, of breaking through and being a regular, uh, things started to happen. We were up at, around the top top uh, of the Premier League and, and qualifying for Europe and stuff. So special, special few years there, maybe five or six years of a, a really, really great place to play football. Given your style of play, a sort of stylish centre midfielder, were people linking you with Johnny Giles, who was at Leeds in the 70s? Um, I, to be honest, uh, just when when we were really, when we were top of the league in the Premier League, and they were comparing us all to to back then, because we, we were, as you said, that sort of next generation, and, and a lot of us came through at the time together. So, but as a player, you very rarely try and listen to it. You try and I just felt like I needed to fight every day to be in the team. The next week, it was such a good squad. And, um, I never really listened to. It. I didn't do many interviews. I was quiet, shy, so I uh, stayed away from the the press side of things um, until I, I, I really, really did throughout my career. But um, I just enjoyed uh, the fight every day to be in the team and, and more concentrating on that. And most people know the class of '92 at United, and then came David O'Leary's babies, as they mm. became known. That squad that he put together with the likes of Harry Kuehl coming through, yourself, Paul Robinson, Jonathan Woodgate, mm. Rio Ferdinand, mm. like it was an unbelievable squad. Yeah, it was, it was, it was unbelievable to be a part of. Um, as I said, George Graham sort of was the start of that, really. Um, he, he gave quite a lot of us a debut out of the U-team, um, Harry being the first one. Harry was someone that uh, gave us all that belief from our U-team. He was a, he was the first one in that, that we can do this. Um, we played each other with each other since we were 15, lived together, um, all that sort of stuff. So it was uh, to see him go on and be a a superstar overnight in the whole league was uh, gave us all, I think, in that U team uh, a belief that we could do it. So, as you said, in the names you mentioned, Alan Smith, all these people, Paul Robinson, John and Woodgate, and the list goes on. Of within that twelve months of Harry getting in, we all seemed to follow. So that was a special time. Dave Valeri obviously took the reins at that stage, and we were, uh, yeah, we just felt like this is where we belonged. We were, we were comfortable in our skins. We knew each other since, as I said, f for the last four years, living in each other's pockets, playing in the U-team. Um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a great, it was a great squad to be involved in. And obviously the older boys were, were unbelievable. David Batty, Jason Wilcox. Um, as you said, Rio came in. He was, Boyer, he was a bit so. early. Lee Bowyer, um, Gary Kelly was such a unbelievable teammate. Um, Ian Hart, he was, a, he was a bit older than us. But it was just a special group to go into, really. Yeah. What changed under David O'Leary at the start? That kind of was it the collection of these players finally coming into coming off age and mm. maturing on the pitch. That first year under him, you just get into the UEFA Cup at the time, and even get to the semi final. Mm. Following year, he's finished third and get Champions League. So, was it just the players, or did he bring an extra factor to it as well? No, he did. He gave us to be fair to, fair to Dave. He gave us a, a probably. More of a style than George, if I'd say that. More of a, a freedom to go and play. Um, I think we were probably better on the eye than maybe George was as manager. Definitely, because we were allowed to play and, and he took the shackles off us a lot. But the foundation that George gave, him, gave us as well as a solid unit was still there. So it just married great um, in terms of how we played. And as you said, I think qualifying for the Euro, uh, Europa League now, but your know, way for back then was big because we, we, we pulled some big, big clubs in that first year and, and we went and performed against Roma, Lazio, all these places. Uh, well, that's the thing about the competition back then. I know people kind of scoff at the Europa League now, mm. but back then the yes. UEFA Cup was, it wasn't really a secondary competition. It was only the champions of the yeah. of their of the leagues across Europe got into the Champions League, so it was the best teams across Europe that didn't win their leagues. 
Exactly. It was a really strong competition. Exactly, really, really strong. We, we, we played them all, all the big names in that first year to get to the semi-final against Galatasaray. It sort of just gave us such more confidence and more uh, belief that this is we can do this. This is we were we were all all eighteen and nineteen at the time, but we were so comfortable in that when we went to these places, um, we produced on the pitch, and that that just bred confidence. And and uh, as you said, then for the next few years, we we went one further in terms of getting to the Champions League and and all that stuff that came with it. But it was uh, yeah, it was just a gave us that bit of arrogance, a bit of swagger that that we probably needed at that time to make sure we knew we're playing for a huge club, obviously, but just the belief that we can compete with anyone in Europe, really. Was there a noticeable change in the way that people on the street looked at you when you got into Europe, that really you were one of the stars of the Premier League for, that was growing faster than anyone could have imagined, and also you were doing it on the European pitch as well? Yeah, it was overnight, really. Everything sort of changed for, our, for a lot of our young lads. Um, we we definitely I think if you if you grow up um, playing for Leeds you're always grounded the, the club doesn't let you get ahead of yourself and um, they've got special people involved Paul Hart Eddie Gray who looked after our youth team were, were special people who kept us grounded kept us focused and made us train hard every day and made sure everything was was kept in line that way but as you said we, uh, going out for some food or going into Leeds to walk around the shops was different <laughs> overnight so um, it's such a huge huge city with, with one club that's fanatical um, little bits and pieces change but you stay grounded when you're, when you're at that club well that's the thing we were actually chatting about Leeds on the football show last night mm. Adam Pope was on from BBC Leeds talking about uh, Marcelo Bielsa's Leeds and the fact that Leeds is a one city team mm. is that really noticeable when you're in Leeds that everybody in the city is behind you yeah, you don't see any other colours and Leeds colours when you're walking through Leeds. You don't see Man United, Liverpool, you don't see it. It's just all Leeds jerseys, the names of the the stars who who are present in the team, um, on the back of the jerseys, kids, fanatical, every every part of even the surrounding areas are fanatical, Harrogate, all these places, York, all all focused on, on, on the, the football club and uh you definitely feel that, and you feel the the realness of the people as well, because they are real people in that north north of England, and they, they understand that football. And two thousand and one was probably a defining season for Leeds. It's when you got to the Champions League semi final. What was that Champions League run first of all? What was that like? How did you find the step up from the UEFA Cup the year before, and also just coming up against the world's biggest stars? Yeah. I'd as you said, I think with such huge clubs we faced in the in the UEFA Cup that the step up wasn't wasn't a huge difference to be honest back then. Um, but yeah, as a player and as a young player, especially a lot of things just probably flew over my head at the time. You just, I honestly just concentrate on what I had to do the next the next game, the next squad, all that sort of stuff was going through my mind. So my, when I look back. When I finished my career, and people say, "What well, was it like playing Champions League?" It was just really wasn't another game for me. I know that's quite cliche, but I, I, I just loved it. I loved playing for Leeds. It was, it was special. If that was a Premier League game or whatever that may be, it was always special to play for Leeds. So, um, but I look back in the the memories and the big games and the big arenas you play, and you never forget that. Yeah, you know, yeah. turning up and and looking at stadiums that are. Like humongous and, and packed out to the rafters and Champions League music, all that I still have in my mind, but I was really just trying to focus on getting in the team and playing. Well, UEFA didn't make it easy for you because mm. it was actually, for people who don't remember, it was the first year that they brought in the yeah. second group stages, so you had to get through Barcelona and AC Milan first, mm. and then you were met by Real Madrid, Lazio and Anderlecht in the group stages. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> looking yeah. at those teams, especially that Barcelona team, that would have had the likes of Rivaldo, yeah. Um, and Clivert and all in, yeah, in it as well. So, what well, was it like coming up against Rivaldo? You would have been probably facing off in midfield, would you? Yeah, he was the best player I've ever played against. Um, unbelievable uh, to get up close. And at the time, I didn't, I didn't think too much of it. I was trying to go out and play and enforce my game, but he was just on a different planet at the time. And any time I got anywhere near him to try and tackle him, he was, it was 
passed and moved and and was seemed to be gone by me and, and just never gave me a chance to get near him. So just way ahead in terms of in his brain, how to play the game. But they were they were an unbelievable football team. I think we, we went to the new camp, that was probably the first game, away game. And we struggled. We really struggled. I think we got B four one or four 0 Read somewhere that you just went to a chapel beforehand. Me, yeah, work. yeah. I told the story probably a while back about me and Gary Kelly going stopping in the chapel and saying a prayer, and then Gaz as he is after the game saying that the prayer didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but now we, uh, it was it was just yeah. You just we just I think it was probably the best thing that ever happened to us coming up against the best in our first game because. We, we I remember the the meeting we had in the dress room after it and how everyone was down and God we just got absolutely tortured there and but that was the realization of where we were and what we had to do and and I remember some harsh words being said and right this is the level this is we have to go if we're gonna get we can't we can't let that happen again and we didn't to be fair we. Um, when they came down the road and then we went to, to play all the other teams, Real and these sort of places, we, we performed and that was the only one we probably let ourselves down in, but it was probably that shock of where we were, the new camp and, as you said, then the players they had at the time, uh, Xavi, Guardiola, um, unbelievable squad of footballers, uh, Rivaldo in his prime, World Player of the Year for, for many years around that time, so it was probably the best thing that happened to us. Is the new camp the biggest stadium we played in? I think so. I, th I think it is. Yeah, um, I was lucky to play in, in all of them really. Uh, but I think it's it is the biggest. Wembley as well is probably up there. But yeah, I think it is the biggest. Yeah. You just go on. You just finally get you just get through the group stage anyway, in your first season, which is impressive enough as it is. Then you beat Deportivo in the quarter final, and at the time Deportivo were. Mm. A brilliant side. I think they went on to get to the final the following year, yeah. and then Valencia under Rafa Benitez uh, in the semi final. Yeah, it was tough at Valencia. It was obviously some unbelievable footballers as well. Uh, great squad. What the first leg we we didn't really perform and gave ourselves didn't give ourselves a chance going into the second leg as as much as we liked, which was a disappointment because um, I do feel. I think if you ask most of the players back then, I think it was a great chance for us to get to a cup final. Um, but yeah, they, they, it was it was uh, gutting at the end to get to get so close. Um, but one that we took some great confidence in and, uh, and built on it really. You know? After that season, is where things start to take a turn. Leeds behind the board, behind all the players, they're banking on getting Champions League, this being a regular thing for the club. And they, to be fair to them, they back David O'Leary again in the transfer window, you bring in Robbie Keane and a couple of other players, and it doesn't work out at the end of the season. You just finish in the UEFA Cup position, not a Champions League position. And regardless of the players, the players had barely anything to do with it. It was more of what was going on behind the board. Mm. Things just start to fall apart. Yeah, it's probably, as you said, Within 12, 18 months of that special uh, Champions League semi final, that we just missed out. I think in goal difference, Liverpool pipped us to the Champions League spot on the last day. I remember it. We were we were away to West Ham, and uh, Gutton going back into the restroom and realised we just missed out. I think it was a goal, one goal in the difference. And if it had been nowadays, we would have had plenty of spots. <laughs> but uh, back then, there wasn't so many spots to, for the Champions League, so. Uh, absolutely gutting, but we went off and thought, right, we can do this again next year. Euro, yeah, UEFA Cup was really special a few years before, three years before or whatever. We go again and we try and win that, and we know how to do it. And um, but obviously behind the scenes, as you said, they they gambled a lot, or if that's the right word, on the financial side of things. And we didn't know as players we come back and. We get ready for the new season, but then you see sort of cracks, meetings have been had, and all the rumours going on in, in in the press and stuff, and and then as you said, within the season that falls apart, which is crazy. Are the players talking amongst themselves at that point, talking about how things might be potentially about to change for the worse? To be honest, no. We, we it only when the when they came to us and asked, could we defer our wages and 
I thought, wow, well, this is this is really in a bad way, and we did. And there was a, we're all we came through the system a lot of the squad, so we weren't ever gonna make things hard for the club. We wanted it to to get back to where it was as quick as possible, but we were still a Premier League club. We were still an unbelievable squad, and then all all of a sudden overnight. People start leaving, and um, even in, in the small things like people in the canteen were leaving, and people that are really close to us, special who looked after us, and the, the heartbeat of the, the club was being being took apart. So little bits like that. So it just shows how quick a, a huge club like that, or any club, and it's, it was probably an eye opener. Looking back. Um, it doesn't matter the size of the club, it can happen if, if, if things aren't ran properly off the pitch and uh, that was heartbreaking because we were, we were all such a such a tight group and such a, even with the supporters, when we got relegated that year, it was an incredible bond between the players because what happened previously and it was heartbreaking to see, see them fall out of the league and, and fall out of uh, where they should be really. You know? What was the feeling when David O'Leary was sacked amongst the players? because I read a quote from Paul Robinson, I'm not sure how accurate the quote is, but things have been written in books from various people that contradict each other's points of view of what actually went on, but it seemed that in uh, Red Steel's book, he claimed that David Leary lost the dressing room, that the players had fallen out with him. Uh, apparently Paul Robinson said he never wanted to play with that B again. How true is that? Which side is it a bit muddled in the middle? Is it a bit, you know, things were just going on in the background and it just didn't work out in the end? Yeah, it's, it's difficult because I'm probably on the other side of it now at Shamrock Rover, so I see the managing of managing up mm -hmm. and dealing with boards and, and, and people like that and chairman and owners and all that sort of thing. So for me to look back now, Dave's probably gone through a hell of a lot of. Uh, issues that the players don't know about in the dressing room um, and keeping that from it and trying to keep the morale and keep all this difficult, really difficult situation. Uh, to be honest, in the cl in the dressing room, he probably did lose it. I don't know if that's from the pressure and not making better decisions or making f people feel uh, wanted or that sort of, yeah, I don't know if it was a bit of arrogance in terms of where we came from and over the years before and just... I, I don't know, it's, it's a difficult one. I, listen, I, I, he gave me a great opportunity, so I don't want to sit here and slate him, but yeah. if you're asking, you're asking me the question of did he lose the dressing room, he probably did, yeah. Was that when Brian Kidd was appointed as assistant ahead of Eddie Gray and listen, that, that, had their relationship yeah, that, with Eddie? That was all probably in the background. Like Eddie's a Leeds legend, the fans probably seen Brian come in from the other side of Manchester, which is not liked in that part of the world. But as a player, as I was still young at the time, I, I, I really liked working with Kiddo. He's, he was really good in the training ground, and him and Eddie seemed to be get on fine. So that was all background stuff for us as players, really. You know? Well, I suppose that's one thing that people take for granted is that a lot of the time the players just get on with yeah, things just do, yeah. and don't pay attention to what's actually happening in the background. Mm. Terry Venables comes in. What's he like as a coach? He has this reputation but never won any trophies. Mm. Um, did he command the dressing room straight away or did was it just players were really heartbroken by players leaving and it just couldn't get going? Yeah, difficult, really difficult for Terry to come into that situation, but he was brilliant. I, he, uh, he coached me in a different way than I've ever been coached. So um, really tactical, really tactically aware of the other team. Um, done a lot of... Uh, shape on the team, so it was different to what I was, I was known um, in in the managers I worked under previously. So it was a f breath of fresh air, Terry, for me, and I I loved it, and I played under him, and he seemed to have confidence in me. So at that stage, I was enjoying my football because I was part of. I think players do when they're playing, and it was still playing in the Premier League, and. Um, but obviously it's so difficult to manage him. I don't know how he did in terms of people leaving and trying to manage the dressing room and keep morale and keep us, t to be fair, to keep us in the hunt to the last day was, was a really good achievement because I don't think uh, any other club or any other manager of, of that time would have 
probably would have we would have been dead and buried at Christmas, really. You know? And Peter Reid comes in and Eddie Gray as well mm. have a go, but they can't stop the inevitable from happening. I suppose if you want to put it that way. When you've reached such a high in the Champions League semi-final, just a, like a year and a half mm. before relegation, what's the feeling of relegation? Unbelievable. The worst feeling I've ever had. You know, it's uh, just because, as you said, within yeah, within the two years we, previous, we were flying, and, and that that's heartbreaking. That you know, this is this is over because people are gone, players are gone. Um, it was yeah. It took such a long time for me to get over in terms of my confidence and to, to play in that last game at Bolton and to be on the pitch when we got relegated. It was just, and see the fans crying and players crying. And it's just, uh, he lives with you because we were still quite young at that, I was still quite young at that age. So, yeah, your confidence takes a knock and it takes some time to, to readjust and get your focus again. But yeah, it's, it's a, it was a heartbreak. And after the relegation, you moved to Barnsley and then eventually yeah. to Cardiff. Uh, while all this is going on, Ireland are on the horizon of a World Cup. And um, I don't know, you, were you in contention for, were you ever in yeah. contention for the World Cup place? Yeah, I was in, in the, the, the bigger squad and, and training. And I probably at that stage, there was, there was a hell of a lot of good midfielders. And, and, that's, and that's where it was. I was so we scrapping to get in that squad. Um, it was difficult. Mick was brilliant to me. He was a great man manager. Always spoke to me. Always gave me his honest opinion. So I was fine with that. It was obviously one thing I always wanted to do was play for Ireland in the World Cup. But um, no, it was, a, it was a great group of, of people as well. And, and, and they go on to to produce unbelievable uh, an unbelievable World Cup. So frustrating watching it because I felt like I could have been there. And I maybe not. Feeling like I should have been, but yeah. well, I was on the on the face of it, when you're looking at a player who's playing in the Champions League semi-final, a year off a World Cup year, I it's incredible listen. that you it didn't even make the squad for it. Yeah, but it's it's it is what it is. It's managing's tough, isn't it? It's big decisions, mm -hmm. um, and they go on and produce what they did. So I'm sure Mick's not too worried about it. But uh, yeah, it's first, it was uh, something that I would have loved to be able to do in my career is playing the World Cup, but it never happened. We'll take a quick break, and after the break, we'll be chatting about uh, your new role in Shamrock Rovers. Now, welcome back. I'm in studio with uh, former Leeds legend and Irish midfielder Steve McPhail, and now sporting director of Shamrock Rovers. An interesting time for Shamrock Rovers, Stephen. Last year, a brilliant season, finished uh, at the end with an FA, FAI Cup, a dr dramatic final, first of all. So it must have been brilliant, first of all, after three or four years of Stephen Bradley building something that you finally have the silverware to cement things. Yeah, it was a great finish to the season, as you said, the last the last day and probably the, the emotion and the 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 way the game uh, played out and uh, winning on penos against our, the rivals in Dundalk have been magnificent over the last five, six, seven years. So um, yeah, great momentum going into this year. We just look forward to trying to compete um, to win some more, some more stuff. Jack Byrne was obviously the main man uh, that was being talked about for Shamrock Rovers from the very beginning of the last season. I was actually, in, when I was uh, preparing for this interview, I stumbled across an interview you did with Stephen Doyle from off the ball ahead of the season, and Jack Byrne was the name that he wanted to talk about. It must have been really just... Brilliant for Shamrock Rovers to see him fulfilling his potential over the course of the year. I know he started a little bit slow, but eventually, once he got his fitness back, he showed what he can do. Yeah, definitely. I think it was a big year for a uh, big, for probably three or four months um, this time last year for Jack in terms of getting his head down and working hard and, and fitting into the group and the group mentality. Um, and he is he, he was brilliant straight from the off. He uh, he talked to what. Uh, what the group is and, and and the morals and all that sort of stuff. So he, we had no doubt in his ability. I don't think that's anyone's in question about that. It was just uh, getting them, as you said, the level of fitness and the level of attitude that makes consistency come in a, in a in a player's game. And as you said, he's, he was magnificent for us in Europe. Um, and then he goes on and towards the back end, he produced some big performances. Did you chat with him personally about that mindset about? 
when he come in, when he comes into Shamrock Rovers, he's gonna have to get that head down and work hard for his place. Yeah, we spoke to him numerous of time uh, before he before he signed of of that of just trying to trying to get a feel for him and him to get a feel for us and, and making sure he knows what he's coming into and that he's gonna have to work hard to get in the team. You can't guarantee anyone uh, a place in in, in a team because you need to work for that themselves. But we we guarantee them that we'll do things right as a staff and we'll push them and we'll try and uh, get a team that, that will suit them in a way of playing and, and I think we did and um, Stephen must take huge credit for that. He managed them great and Stephen does still to this day manage them really well. Um, we try and stay out of them sort of things, let let them the uh, Stephen deal deal with the squad but he's uh, he's he's been he's been great, listen, it's a, it's it's only a year and um, he needs to go and do it again now, so it's, it's a big year again for him. How big was that trophy for Stephen Bradley? Because I know the two of you are cl close, and maybe two seasons ago he came under a bit of pressure from maybe not the Shamrock Rovers fans, but other fans were saying that he, he wasn't going to achieve what he was going to achieve, but eventually he has built a squad. So was that a kind of breakthrough moment for Stephen himself as a manager? I think so. I think all the hard work that he led um, in the couple of years previous Going into his tour year was probably always in mind and his. It is, it was, because we spoke about it at the very start that this was the season that we'd have our own squad um, that we built and um, and his staff have been excellent with him around the place. Glenn and Darren and Tony McCarthy and all these people, Jose, our goalkeeping coach. You can just feel that we were ready for something because we believed exactly what we were doing and the way the team played, the formation, everything was quite clear for us so it was, a, it was a huge turning point I think for him and the group that now they can believe that uh, they can go and win stuff it's huge for any group I think to get over the line I was lucky enough to win a few things in my career and that I always felt that that gave us another drive to go again so you get that feeling of lifting a cup or whatever that may be winning a league you want you need to do it again you need to get that feeling every year and uh, that's what we hope the momentum's uh, with us this year and we try and go and, and, and keep producing. And you managed to maintain most of the squad anyway mm. um, going into the next season. Are you confident enough that you can push Dundalk even closer for the league title this year? Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Obviously, Dundalk have done unbelievable things. I have so much respect for what they've done. And, and Vinny, uh, uh, last year coming in, stepping up after Stephen's uh, departure, has been excellent. So we know we're, in, we're, we're probably... Our points total last year would have won it any other, any other year. So it's we know we have to go again. We know we have to uh, really be at our game and make sure every game counts this year, and get that consistency that 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 means putting a big, big total of points on the board because that's all it'll take this year. But we're we're looking forward to it. As you said, it was a it's a great finish to the last day of the season last year. So we go again in a couple of weeks' time. And just finally, before I let you go, there's two. Very interesting points about the League of Ireland this season come along. One of them is Shamrock over Bees, accepted into Division One. Um, how far is that away from being a real life, a reality? Are they going to have a, a team on the pitch in the first game of the season? And what's that team going to look like? Do you think? Yeah, that's we're planning. We're only weeks away, so we haven't been told otherwise. We're uh, we're delighted, uh, to be honest. We it's, uh, we feel like it's a continuation of our academy because we have nowhere for our 19s, uh, only our first team. So we feel there's a, a, a there's a gap there that needs filling. We have no other option in terms of a 23s league, a reserve league. So for our kids to develop um, that mightn't be ready at 19, 18, uh, 20 for the first team. Yeah. There's nothing for them. So, so well, it's going to be massive as well because of the news that sort of came out last night that after Brexit, Premier League clubs may not be able to sign minors. Yeah, exactly. That that's, could be on the cards. I know that's not official as yet in terms of UEFA, but it looks that that, that could happen. So we need to have a, uh, a pathway for our kids. We can't be... We, we were letting go... Uh, 18, 18, 19 year olds last year because they've not nowhere to put them. And they probably eight out of the 11 or 12 that we let go, don't, don't play football again. So you're actually losing them to the game. So that's, that's important for us that we give them them extra year or two that makes them develop as a footballer and keeps them in, in the game. 
they might never play for Shamrock Rovers first team, but hopefully they'll have some sort of career if that's yeah. whatever that we don't. At 18, which is a tough, tough year, years in, in kids' life, they're going through, leaving cert, they're going through, um, out with their mates, all this sort of stuff, girls start happening, all that sort of, you cannot give another bit of bad news to a kid that age and expect them to go and bounce and, and get his head down. Some of them don't and, yeah. and aren't ready for that. It's a tough, it's a tough, difficult age, so you need to have that pathway, but you need to, we can't lose six or eight players to the whole game. Uh, just because we haven't got an extra team for them or, or an extra development stage to get them to where they want to be. Yeah, and I suppose it's not just as easy as them going and looking for another Irish club. I mean, it's it's as hard moving to the likes of Athlone or Cork from Dublin at 18 as it is going across the water. Yeah, it could, it could, it could be anyway. It could be Glenza Senior. It could be just once they stay in the game. We can be, it's hard, like We're probably one of the biggest clubs in the country and to get bad news from from that might feel like oh, what's the point mm -hmm. you know so that that's that's the reaction i think uh you get off players and it's 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 one that we we can't as a country uh, accept we need we need we need that that uh that that critical stage to be be something there for 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 player development and another thing that's popped up before this season has been the All Ireland League. Um, there, I know there's a couple of meetings in in recent uh, recent times about it. The IFA are speaking to the the people who are present are presenting the idea of it. Where do Shamrock Rovers stand in it? Are they for it? Are they against it? Or do they, yeah, are look, they just concentrating on what's going on at the minute, or how how's it going? There is a lot that goes on in the running of uh, the club, so focus is probably not so much on it but if you're asking as, as a f the football side of things I think it, it could be an no-brainer like in terms of progressing and, and getting clubs better and more professional and and uh, I just feel that something needs to change and we, we've we've got a bit of change uh, in the FAO at the moment I think the uh, people that are going in will make some changes so I think it's definitely worth looking at really hard and I know uh, the group is, is pushing it and, and their, their ideas and there's a, another, as you said, another few meetings this week. So as from a football point of view, I think it'd be great, but obviously there's a lot that goes with it. Yeah. And again, sort of like Shamrock Rovers Bees, it opens up a vast amount of clubs in the north that may not be an exactly an exciting uh, prospect for a young player to go up into Northern Ireland and play them, but if it's part of an All-Island all League, then it's it's a much more open thing to do. Like yeah. it, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a strange decision for them to move to another league. Exactly. I think it opens up a lot for, even for coaches and, and um, it just opens different avenues in terms of revenue and all that sort of thing. So we have to take it serious. I don't think uh, we can just brush it aside and think the way we're doing things now is the right way. We have to be open to ideas, but um, obviously there's a lot of stuff that needs to be sorted out in the meantime. Well, Stephen, you've been brilliant with your time. Thanks very much for coming in. And uh, hopefully Leeds actually get promoted this year so that we can see them back in the, uh, in the Premier League for good.